and we'll begin the day. Okay. So handing okay. over to Ajahn Pamali. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So uh, that is my favorite saying these days is okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you have heard this before. This is uh, something I learned in Thailand when I was in Thailand. Uh, this is now, it's almost a year and a half ago, just before the pandemic started out. And, and I visited this very famous monk, Ajahn Ganha, known as Lumpur Ganha, which means like Venerable Father Gan uh, Ganha. And he, he is very sweet. Not only sweet, he's super, super duper sweet. And some people say he's an arahant, and who knows what he is. But he is, uh, he says, he doesn't speak much English. At all, but it's okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's very nice because when you are with someone like that, someone who's so super sweet, who has so much metta and so much kind of endless kindness coming out of pouring out of them, yeah. And, and then they say, okay, okay, it just has this kind of you can't really forget it afterwards, it sticks in your mind because it has this kind of resonance of kind of it. And uh, just the, I don't know, I just like the saying, okay, it just sounds kind of innocent and sweet in his own right. So I, these days I say, okay, okay, annoy, annoy all my fellow monks in the monastery over here. I say, <laughs> okay, okay, far too often, <laughs> which is great. So but this is one of the things in the world is that uh, we have been focusing on the idea of uh, dukkha, of suffering and so far, because we have been asking the question of why, and of course the why has to relate to something. Yeah. And what it relates to here now is uh, dukkha. Why is there dukkha? And we're going to look at that causal sequence. But uh, as I mentioned yesterday, when you focus on uh, the negative aspects of life, you also have to remember the positive. Right? Because if you focus too much, if you get too one-sided, and you uh, can lose the joy. And oh, that might, it's so important to get that joy. And, and the little things like meeting a great spiritual master with a, a special... Uh, Characteristics, etc. That, that, oh, just that memory, just that meeting is often enough to remind you of the power of the Dharma to bring joy into the world. Yeah, you sometimes you need that living example, that seeing someone who is special. That, and without that living example, it can become so dry, and it can become not really. Uh, it becomes kind of unreal in a sense. It becomes ink on a piece of paper or pixels on a screen, and, and it doesn't really. Uh, it doesn't really kind of uh, do anything to your emotions, it doesn't really motivate you. Emotions are what motivate us, feelings motivate us. Uh, but uh, intellectual ideas tend to be, uh, they have to be, they can be motivating, but they have to come with something more, something which is, uh, gives it a bit of, uh, um, I don't know, uh, something special anyway. Yeah. So uh, I want, now I'm going to come back to the idea of uh, dukkha again. Uh, and continue to look at the first noble truth that we started to look at yesterday. Uh, yesterday we were focusing on uh, uh, death, yeah, the joyful death, yay, death. <laughs> and looking at that, most people in the world think you are nuts to talk so much about death, but death is, uh, the, the suffering of death is vastly overestimated. Yeah, death is often, for a lot of people, like, uh, you know, Adam Brown likes to say, death is liberating, it's a freeing experience. You're trapped in this body, and you want to get out of it because you had enough, it's falling apart, you can't see, you can't hear, you can't walk, you can just lie in your bed, people have to look after you. It's just a terrible experience for many people. And then when you die, you're liberated from a large amount of suffering. So the idea, death is often kind of uh, maligned, yeah? And actually, maybe death isn't as bad as we think it is. But of course, it all depends on how you live. That is the critical factor. That is one of the, of course, most important uh, uh, lessons uh, for what we were talking about yesterday with the idea of death. Uh, and I just want to reiterate that um, death has a very, or the contemplation of death or the reflection of death uh, has a very important part uh, on the Buddhist path. Uh, it's very important uh, in the Buddha's own biography, in the Buddha to be's ability to reach awakening. Uh, as I said yesterday, the awakening of experience of the Buddha really is uh, uh, predicated on, it is based on, it is founded on uh, the Buddha to be reflecting on death in a very profound way. It's a death reflection that actually started his whole search. So we can, in a sense, we can thank the existence of the Dhamma, the existence of Buddhism, on one person reflecting on death in a very profound way. 
that's quite extraordinary. That says something about the potential for this particular reflection. And of course, the Buddha then goes on and he uses this reflection throughout the sutta. So, yeah, so it is very important. It's important to get our values right, to understand what really matters in this world. Once you have your values right, once you understand what matters, uh, then your priorities fall into place. You start to act in accordance with the Dhamma and everything kind of comes out of that. Uh, but the idea of having the right values is obviously essential for this path to really work out properly. And death does that. It gives the right values, but it also helps you for your moment to moment uh, kindness as well, because it reminds you of what really matters in life. Again, bad values, of course, but also uh, in the face of death, we tend to want to be kind rather than doing uh, bad things. <laughs> so, um, uh, that is the death. I'm not going to go on much more about that. I want to move on to the uh, next part of this uh, uh, first noble truth. Uh, but before I do that, I just wanted very briefly to uh, look at something from a slightly different angle. And uh, one of the ways that I like to divide the idea of suffering into three different aspects. One is the suffering of immorality, or if you like, of lack of kindness. Yeah, this is like the basic suffering in life. If you live in the wrong way, you create suffering for yourself and others. Then there is the suffering of the ordinary sensory world around us, the five senses and all of that, which is really very important and very significant to understand because that is what allows you ultimately enter samadhi and deep meditation to understand that, that problem and then ultimately it is the suffering of having a sense of self you can think of suffering in these three ways and of course the buddha talks about this he never puts them together in three in these three ways but it's a nice way of thinking about things and just very briefly we talked about this yesterday but obviously the uh, the most foundational of these is to understand the suffering of immorality or of lack of kindness, if you like, to understand how you let yourself down, how you let other people down, how you create so much misery, how you allow your habits and your, uh, you know, your, your, um, your ways that you've been doing things for a long, long time into the, in the past to overpower you and keep you doing the same mistakes again and again. Uh, Never do that. Remember, every time you are doing something that isn't quite right, every time you don't do what is kind, you are wasting an opportunity. You're wasting an opportunity to take one more step forward on the path. And we can't afford to waste those opportunities. Time is so short. Yeah, I, I can't believe how old I am already. It's just kind of astonishing when I look at it. I don't kind of uh, you know, I, I can feel it physically, but mentally it's a bit different. But life is just so swept away, as it says in the suttas. We're going to have a look at one of those uh, little suttas later on. It's swept away by the current of things happening around us, of craving, of desire, of the world is faring on so fast. Uh, and the more you get that, the more you feel that, the more you understand the urgency of doing what is right, uh, not doing what is wrong. Uh, and uh, that is really uh, kind of so critical for this path. And every time we allow ourselves not to do what is right or doing what's wrong, yeah, we are enforcing our old habits. Yeah, remember that very often. Say, yeah, it doesn't matter so much this one time. Yeah, this one time is okay to I kind of always be kind. Uh, sometimes you get grumpy and you have to kind of excuse yourself. And of course, you need to forgive yourself if you do a mistake. You will always make some mistakes. But we need to minimize that to an absolute minimum. When it's important not to allow our habits uh, to guide us and to drive us, but to challenge those habits at every possible opportunity. Uh, because it is those habits that keep us back. We need to challenge those to ask ourselves, how can I look at the world in a different way? How can I look at people in a different way? And then true morality, true kindness, and the deepest sense of the word starts to become possible. So remember just the enormous amount of suffering that lack of morality has caused us already. In the sense, the reason that we are here right now, all of us still 
in the human realm, yeah, striving, trying, trying to find a solution. I mean, it's marvelous, you know, all of us here, we are, we are trying, we're trying our very best to get out of this mess and find a way forward. So good on you, as they say here in Australia, good on you. This is one of the Australian sayings, that means like, well done or something like that. And uh, I have my Australian citizenship now, so I have to use a few Australian kind of, you know, expressions, otherwise not the real deal. And not the, uh, uh, what is it called? Not, not the uh, fair income Aussie. Yeah, you, you, fair income Aussie, not an Australian expression. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, so it, it matters so enormously to come back to this morality. Everything matters all the time. And if we can get this right, that is when we are really uh, living the moral life of Buddhism in the appropriate way to kind of take us all the way to the end of, of suffering as a consequence. We have still stuck here precisely because we haven't been living that uh, life with moral perfection previously. We forgot about these things uh, and that is why it has become so problematic. Yeah. So that is the first aspect of virtue and I would really recommend you, this is so important to reflect on this, uh, the more clear the problem becomes of lack of kindness and morality in your life, uh, the more motivated you're going to be uh, to actually practice this in the right way. It's always going to be at the back of your mind. Uh, it's going to be there together with your mindfulness, mindfulness and kindness conjoined, uh, pointing you in the right direction at all opportunities, every moment in your life. That is when things really come together. Uh, but then there is the other aspect of morality, which is a higher aspect, not, not of morality of, of dukkha, I should say, which is a higher kind of aspect. Uh, and that is to understand the dukkha of the five senses. Uh, yeah? And uh, this is what we're going to talk about now in a second anyway, because a, a lot of this next sutta is precisely about that. Uh, and it is an extraordinarily important part of the Buddhist teaching. This can, cannot really be overestimated. Uh, and it is so important because it is this that blocks us from accessing deep meditation. Yeah, it is this where we hold on. This is where we are attached. It is this world that we are attached to. People talk about being attached to somebody about deep meditation, but that's not the issue at all. The issue is always attachment to the five senses. That is what blocks you from entering samadhi, nothing else. That is the issue. That is what we should be focusing on. And so understanding the limitations of the five sense world, understanding why it is problematic, understanding why it is out of control, why it is always going to let us down, it's very, very useful because it will gradually uh, reduce some of the bondage and the attachment to that world. And it's important to understand how important that world actually is. It's to us. Yeah, you wake up in the morning, you are straight away in that five sense world. It is like we are immersed in that five sense world. Yeah, immersed from the moment you wake up in the morning throughout the day until you, uh, I was going to say, pass out at night again. All the time we're in that five sense world, except maybe for a short time when you're meditating. If your meditation is going well, if your meditation isn't going well, well, you're still immersed in that five sense world, yeah? Then at night you dream, and what do you dream? Five sense world, yeah, so it's more of the same. So we are so immersed in this. It is almost our entire existence is that five sense world. It's everything, yeah? When I sit here now in our little studio here in Bodhinyana Monastery, we have a little kind of video studio now because we do so much zooming around the world. Not the zooming by plane, but zooming by internet, uh, which is uh, uh, in many ways a, I don't know, it's okay, less flying is great, but uh, it's a bit not so good not to have that contact with people. It's a little bit different to talk to a camera than talking to, <laughs> to people, if you know what that means. I know you're out there, but it's kind of still a different feeling here. But we, we make but when I sit here in our little studio, you know, this is it. What I see around me and what each one of you sees around you where you're sitting now, that is it. That's the five sense world right there. The seeing, the hearing, the touching, the tasting of coffee. I had a bit of coffee before I started this. And so it is this extraordinary, of course, because we are so immersed in this, it means that our attachment to that world is very profound. 
if someone says that I'm, you know, you, you will no longer be allowed to see or to hear or whatever, yeah, you will rebel. You will say, no, thank you. I would actually, I would rather see. I would rather hear things uh, rather than these things being taken away from. Yeah. But in meditation, we are voluntarily giving up the hearing and seeing in a very profound sense. And you can only do that if you are not so attached to that world. So this is what I mean when I said yesterday that the idea of translating the Pali word karma as sensual pleasure, it misses so much. Sensual pleasure gives this feeling of some kind of inner desire, yeah, or the pleasures that you, know, you experience personally. But actually, it's almost everything. It's the whole world. It's everything out there you can think of. And it's also your ideas about that, that world. It's your ideas about how that world is, whether it's going right or wrong or sideways or whatever it is. All of that stuff is included in that. It's such a massive field. It's almost the entire range of our experiences in this life. And if we get reborn, the chances are we will get reborn in the sensual realm again, because almost everybody, almost all beings get reborn in the sensory realm one way or another. So we need to reflect on this. We need to get some clarity about that sensory world. And that's why I'm going to talk more about this in a second. Then there is the... Um, uh, I. Someone just put up a little notice there, so thank you for making that point, that uh, when I said karma, what I mean is uh, the karma in terms of sensory world, not karma, 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 two different words pronounced slightly differently. If you have a good ear, you can hear the difference. Karma, karma. One is a long A, one is a short, short A, double consonant. Anyway. Um, so, uh, but then there is the last aspect of dukkha, which is the aspect of the sense of I, yeah, having a sense of I uh, in this world. Uh, and this, of course, is the most profound aspect uh, of the Buddhist path. Uh, and this is just the, uh, the reality, as long as we have a sense of I, uh, as long as we have a sense of me and mine, which comes with the idea of I, uh, we are going to attach to things in the world. Uh, and the moment you attach to the things in the world, because everything in our experience is impermanent and unreliable and uncertain, uh, then you're asking for trouble, you're asking for suffering already. Uh, so that is the, that is what I said, the whole sense of I is so problematic, uh, because it is the function of the I is to grasp onto things in the world. Uh, Primarily, the eye grasps onto the inner qualities we have. It identifies with the kandas, with our perception, our will, and all of these kind of things. And then it moves from that inner experience to the experience in the world outside, because there is no real barrier between inner and outer experience. The outer experiences inform the inner experiences. They are bound up with each other and not really different. That is the most, the deepest kind of problem, the deepest kind of dukkha that comes from the very existence of I. Isn't that kind of astonishing that I is a problem? I said that yesterday that, you know, we celebrate the I, the ego in the world, trying to build it up, get it just right, and then what it kind of makes it all crash down and say, this is your way to find, what is the point of building up this eye? There is nothing really there to be taken as an eye. And all it does is lead to suffering. <laughs> and then people say we are pessimistic. I wonder, I wonder why. No, I, I, of course, we're not pessimistic at all because we have a solution to the problem. But um, what I want to do now is to carry on. We're looking more at the second of these two kinds of suffering. And, the suffering that has to do with the entire sensory dhamma. And uh, this is what happens next in the Dhamma Chakka Pavantana Sutta, the uh, setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma, the first discourse of the Buddha. I read it out to you yesterday. And uh, the next part here is that association with the disliked is suffering, separation from the liked is suffering, not getting what you wish for is suffering. Yeah, and um, this, of course, is the nature of life. Yeah, the, uh, this is kind of what our life is about. Yeah, in daily, just our daily existence. This is what happens to us all, all the time. Association is light. Yeah, when you hear something you don't like, when you have a pain in the body, 
when uh, something goes wrong, when you have a problem, this is endless yeah, association with uh, this light. Uh, separation from the light, uh, so just the reverse, yeah, the same kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, when, you know, simple thing, people dying or people getting sick or, or just losing things or again, whatever it is, things going wrong and all of these kinds of things. And then the last one, not getting what you want. Yeah, this is actually quite profound, the idea of not getting what you want. I was talking, Venerable Chanda asked me the question yesterday about, uh, or it was from one of the participants, presumably, why is it that the Buddhist teaching is the answer to the question of the meaning of life? How is that the case? And this is such a fascinating thing. Yeah, if Buddhism really is the answer to the question of the meaning of life, which to me it obviously is, then of course, this is all we want to do. Yeah, there's, there's nothing else to be done really. But um, uh, so, so the point here, uh, the, the problem here, I lost my train of thought there a little bit. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the point here, not getting what you want, yeah, uh, this is exactly what this is about, this idea of uh, the, the purpose of life. Because uh, uh, what we really want, what we want deep down is always this sense of completion, uh, yeah, the sense of not feeling that there is something missing inside of us, an emptiness, a hole, a gap that needs to be filled in. And that is the same thing as having a sense of contentment and satisfaction. We're all searching for it. And we're looking for it in the wrong place. We're running around in the world trying to fill an inner psychological gap with external things. And it's, you know, it's just obvious that this is not going to work. How can that possibly work? How can an inner, an existential problem, if you like, something deeply psychological, how can it ever be fulfilled by external things, by relationships, by material things, by status, by fame, or glory, or whatever it is? It's obviously impossible. Huh? And that's why we keep on running. Huh? And that's why we never get what we want. Yeah, not getting what you want is suffering. We never get what we want. And that is that external realm of five senses that never gives you what you want. Uh, it's bad enough to be separated from what you like, yeah? Some dear people, people who are dear to you. It is bad enough to have to <clears throat> be united with things that you don't like. Yeah? But this idea that we never really achieve what we want, uh, that we are running on this treadmill driven by craving, yeah? Tanhadasa, one of my favorite little phrases from the suttas. Tanhadasa means a slave to craving. Craving is whipping us over the back, making us run around like little rats in a treadmill, going around and around and around, uh, you're never really getting anywhere. This is basically the suffering of human life, a very large part of it. Uh, and often we can't even see it. We can't even begin to understand what this is about. Why? Well, because in our world, we a glorified craving, we glorify action, we glorify doing it as if these things are really something positive to be looked at. We haven't got enough perspective to be able to stand back and see these things for the problem that they actually are. That is really the issue here. This is what delusion is. This is why the Buddha places so much emphasis on delusion. Yeah, because delusion is that lack of ability to understand this basic aspect of existence. So this is the problem with that five sense world. It never gives that kind of satisfaction that we're looking for. It is always inherently problematic. We always, whether you want to or not, you're always going to be united with things that you don't like. You're always going to be separated from things you like. Nature is going to claim its own. Nature is going to take back what actually belongs to it. People's lives. The things that you own in this world, even your inner psychological possessions, who you th think yourself, take yourself to be, that too is going to be taken away from you. Why? Because it is related to things externally that are inherently, that are out of control, uh, impermanent and, and problematic. So that is my uh, kind of happy start for today's talk. So I hope you are not too uh, worried about this. <laughs> uh, and uh, again, remember, we're talking about the suffering side of things now. We're going to come back to the uh, reverse side of the coin in a couple of days' time, maybe tomorrow already. We'll see what happens. And uh, uh, maybe not tomorrow, maybe the day after tomorrow. 
And then we're going to look at the positive side of things, yeah, because it is weird, even though we talk about suffering, the Buddhist path is full of joy, full of happiness, full of tranquility. It is the best path we can possibly ever walk. This is kind of the weird uh, thing about this. But for now, we're going to keep our focus on suffering and on the problems of the world to try to um, gain a perspective and a perception of the world that is suitable and helpful for uh, meditation practice. So that is kind of the point with it. So, so now I'm going to uh, move on to the uh, Portalia Sutta. This is the uh, second sutta uh, in the, this list of suttas that we have uh, this course of the Buddha. This is from the uh, Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length sayings of the Buddha, number 54. Uh, and this is the Buddha in conversation with a man called Portalia. It's called the Wanderer because he's wandering around. Uh, and uh, they have this conversation, and this Portalia thinks that he is already a real second, and the Buddha does not agree. And uh, this is that the conversation they have. The Buddha is trying to convince him that there are problems with the, the sensory world. They yeah? are trying to make him understand the deeper aspect of existence. And, and this is what uh, uh, this is this conversation that uh, uh, ensues from that. Uh, so here we have these uh, uh, famous similes of the Buddha. Some of these similes we were already talking about yesterday. I'm not going to talk about them much more today, uh, but. Uh, I will talk about the old ones, but I might mention them all just very briefly. So I will, I just want to read it out for you because I think it's nice just to hear the word of the Buddha. Yeah, I, I think that's important. If I paraphrase phrase everything, I am going to corrupt and pollute the teachings of the Buddha. And lo and behold, I do not want to pollute the teachings of the Buddha. They probably are a bit polluted already just by translating. You kind of pollute things a little bit and you lose. It's impossible to recreate of course, the power of the original completely and uh, you really have to be in the Buddha's presence for that to happen but we'll try to get as close as we can there. So this is what the uh, Buddha says to this man Potalia. He says, householder, huh? suppose a dog weak with hunger huh? was hanging around a butcher's shop. Then a deaf butcher or their apprentice huh? would toss them a skeleton, scraped clean of flesh and smeared with blood. What do you think, householder, knowing on such a fleshless skeleton, would that dog still get rid of its hunger? No, sir. Why not? Because that skeleton is scraped clean of flesh and smeared in blood. That dog would eventually get weary and frustrated. In the same way, says the Buddha, a noble disciple reflects with a simile of a skeleton that the Buddha said that sensual objects, sensual objects, the sensory world, the sensual uh, worldly pleasures, uh, not sensual pleasures, manufacture and much suffering and distress, uh, all the more full of drawbacks. Uh, having truly seen this with right understanding, they reject the equanimity based on diversity and develop only equanimity based on unity. All kinds of grasping to the world's material delights cease without anything left over. So that is this uh, very powerful simile. And uh, these are some of the issues that I have been talking about already about how we kind of we crave, yeah, here you have this dog, which obviously here is almost, it's like the simile, the simile for the human being, the metaphor for the human being in this particular case. And the dog is weak and hungry. In other words, it's craving, yeah, it's craving. And craving makes you weak because craving makes the mind restless and agitated and frustrated. And because of that craving, you, you know, that weakness, all of those things you're searching for a solution and that search for solution happen happens uh, around the butcher shop uh, butcher shop is here the uh, simile for the world of this all the sensory objects in the world we're looking at them uh, and then we're trying to get hold of them 
trying to find satisfaction in that world there. And then as we hang out, the dog hangs out, this butcher shopper, yeah, eventually that butcher, it scrapes clean uh, some bones because he wants to sell or she wants to sell that meat to uh, the customers uh, and it chucks the bone to the dog. Yeah. And what happens to the dog? Well, the dog, uh, when it eats a bone which is smeared with blood but does, doesn't have any flesh, uh, of course the dog doesn't find any satisfaction there. All that happens with the dog, it gets even more craving. Yeah. It tastes the blood, yeah, you know, it tastes like the real thing, yeah. There's something there which is, yeah, if I only got enough of this, if I got this in the right way, if I just found the right butcher, yeah, this butcher is too, too stingy. I need to find a butcher who has generosity for dogs, who has compassion and sympathy for four-legged beings, and then maybe I will, you know, I will be okay. I will finally get that satisfaction. And of course, what happens because that dog is, just gets weary and frustrated. What happens then, of course, it runs off to the next butcher shop. Yeah? This is just the nature of dogs because it has to have that sustenance from somewhere. Yeah? And it carries on, it gets, goes on to the next butcher shop and on and on, and on. craving always staying pretty much the same, getting a tiny bit of satisfaction from the blood that it is licking from the bones and moving on again to the next butcher shop after that. Uh, on and on, until what? Uh, until one day it dies. And when the dog dog dies because it is still attached to those bones. It is still looking for bones in its mind. It gets reborn as a little puppy. Yeah, and when it gets reborn as a little puppy, its mother takes it to the next butcher shop. And it grows up learning about butcher shops, but not learning about the problem of not getting any sustenance from those shops. Not learning, not, never really learning about seeing the reality clearly of what is going on there. And in this way, it's kind of a tragedy. It's like a Greek tragedy. You just go on and on. You never really find any solution. Round and round and round. And of course, this is exactly what we do as human beings. Not as stark, perhaps quite as stark as this. The basic idea is the same. Running after things. And this is why we are so restless in our lives. This is what drives us yeah, from the moment we get up in the morning to the weekend go to bed at night, this is what drives the dreaming and everything that we do, as I mentioned before. And this is kind of the eternal moving on, moving on to what? To nothing, nothing but death down the track. And then more of the same when you get reborn again into the future. All we can look forward in this little round of things is dying, dying in the same way that we have lived, and then getting reborn in the same way again. When we think about it, it sounds Awful, yeah, it sounds terrible. Huh? And the reason we can't see this is precisely because we haven't got that perspective. Huh? We can't see beyond the barrier of death. It's like a block, a hindrance, huh? which stops us from seeing the reality of existence. Huh? But if we saw it, we would see this eternal running on, huh? going nowhere, roaming around, as it says in the suttas. Huh? I love this word roaming because. The idea of roaming means that there is no destination. Roaming means you're not going anywhere in particular. You're like this random being going left, right, forward, backwards, up and down, without destination, without purpose, without aim, without goal, round and round, doing the same things again and again. This is like the big picture there. And uh, it sounds quite bleak. Yeah? And this is kind of the point of the Buddha. He's trying to help us to stand back and see what is truly going on here. And the more you get that, the more, of course, you start to understand the problem with this entire sensory realm. And as I was saying yesterday, the alternative, of course, is so beautiful because the alternative is the happiness, not the searching for happiness where it cannot be found in that sensory realm, this eternal craving that drives you on. But the alternative is to look inside instead and find a happiness that really is satisfying. The happiness of kindness, the happiness of compassion, the happiness of caring for others, the happiness that eventually comes into meditation practice itself. When you start to really feel fulfilled inside and craving dies down, yeah, that is the alternative. That is where you find real meaning. That is where ultimately you find the answer to the meaning of life itself, as I mentioned yesterday in last night's talk. So um, 
that is the two contrasts here, the contrast with the dog and the, with the, uh, the meditator or the spiritual practitioner uh, and why one is much superior to the other. Uh. And uh, of course, once you do that, as it says here, then you see the problem with that sensory world, you reject the equanimity based on diversity. This is the equanimity or the equanimity that relates to that world of the five senses. And yeah, you give up that world completely of the five senses. You know it is no longer satisfactory. Even the equanimity in that world is not good. And then you move towards the equanimity based on unity, which is the equanimity of samadhi, the equanimity of the jhanas, if you like, especially the very deep jhana states. And uh, then it says that all kinds of grasping to the world's material lights, they cease without remainder. Uh, you lose interest in that world. Why? Because you have found something which is far, far, far superior to what you had before. Uh, so that is the uh, simile of the uh, dog hanging out of the butcher shop. Uh, let's move on to the next simile. I'm going to go through all of these ones. I love these similes. I'm just doing it. If I apologize, sometimes I do this thing just because I enjoy it. Uh, yeah. And so I do it for myself. And hopefully you will enjoy it too. I think usually people do. But uh, if not, if you don't enjoy this thing, if you think it's a bit too much, at the very least, reflect on it and see if it can make some sense to you. Uh, so the next one. Uh, suppose a vulture or a crow or a hawk was to grab a lump of meat and fly away. Other vultures, crows and hawks would keep chasing it, pecking and clawing it. What do you think, householder, if that vulture, crow or hawk doesn't quickly let go of that lump of meat, wouldn't that result in death or death-like suffering and bird? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, the Buddha, and then he carries on, yeah, and because the Buddha has compared a, a sensory objects to a piece of meat, yeah, that's what he's saying here. Uh, in that way, we give up those, uh, uh, those sensory uh, objects of the world and you go move towards the equanimity of unity, etc., etc. So this is another uh, very interesting one, and I think uh, in many ways also quite profound because it... Uh, shows you a very important downside of the sensory objects of the world. Yeah, this is the idea that we always fight over the sensory objects. The, the lump of meat here is obviously a metaphor for the objects of the world that we're all chasing. Yeah? And if you think about it, so much of our life is uh, actually is a, in competition with others. Yeah, we're competing to get the best grades at school. Uh, we're competing to get the best girlfriend or boyfriend, uh, yeah, uh, wife or husband, whatever it is. Uh, we're competing to get the best job. Uh, we're competing within the company to get promotions, uh, yeah, with the boss. Uh, we're competing to get more salary. Uh, we are jealous in our life. That's a kind of competition as well. We are jealous in our life if we think that our partner might be cheating on us or maybe, you know, looking for something else or whatever it is. Uh, uh, we are we fight over the inheritance that our parents leave us. Uh, children fight over toys or biscuits or whatever it might be. Uh, yeah, we live in a world of limited resources. Uh, we all desire the same things. Uh, we all want the biggest houses, the best cars. Uh, we all want the highest salaries. We want the best partner in life. We all want the same thing. But the world has limited resources. Uh, it's impossible to satisfy the craving of everyone because everyone ultimately wants the whole universe. Yeah, and if everyone wants the whole universe, well, then we have a problem. It's kind of strange. You might not think that you want the universe, but uh, your craving will expand to fill the whole universe if you allow it to. That's the problem with craving. Yeah. And uh, so there is always this competition in a society, in our society. As long as we are interested in the sensory the worldly pleasures, the sensory objects, the things of the sensory world, there's always going to be conflict. We're always going to be in competition with other people. There's going to be rivalry, there's going to be jealousy, there's going to be envy because we want to have the same thing. This is inherent to the sensory world. And that is kind of awful when you think about it. Yeah, you, we know how in politics, 
the takes. We try to create an ideal world. We try to kind of have the, a good social security system. We try to kind of make our institutions run well as so a society runs smoothly. And of course, there is something to be said for that. Of course, we can improve society to some extent. But there's always going to be, the downside is always going to be there. It's impossible to create a perfect society because in the end, there's always going to be conflict. We're always going to be fighting over the thing of the world because everyone wants these things. There's always going to be war, I say. There's always going to be conflict between human beings. There's always going to be problems. And that is the downside of sensory pleasure. Ill will, anger, conflict, violence go hand in hand with the sensory objects of the world. So that makes it really off-putting, right? When you start to see that, it makes that whole world, when you look at that world, when I look out right now and look at this room around me, what I should really see is conflict. I should see violence. I should see the, the um, uh, you know, see the ill will and the downside that exists, that is part of the fabric of all the things happening here. Then I'm looking at it in the right way. It's kind of interesting when you start to look at the world around you in a new way. Yeah? What are the things that you see? And very often when I look at the world around me, I, like most people, I look for the beautiful. Yeah? I look out of the window, I see, ah, oh, beautiful trees outside. Actually, today is a bit gray here in Australia. It's not so, the weather isn't marvelous. Uh, or I look at something else, uh, you know, which is, it, which is nice. Uh, and, but actually, what we should look for instead, we should always remember that when we look at that world, we should often see the downside. We should see the impermanence. When I look at the world in front of me, the wall in front of me, what I should see is the beginning of the crumbling of that wall. How the bricks are already starting to chip a little bit, perhaps here and there. How the crumbling is gradually happening. That is what I should be looking for. I should be looking for the violence and the kind of the, all the problems and all the um, rivalry and problems have to building this thing. Yeah, People argue when they build things because building, you have different opinions about things. That is part of the arguments of that world. Looking at the negative side, remembering that's part of it. The beauty is only one side of the coin and we forget to remember the opposite side. And I think this is one of those very off-putting aspects of the sensory world that is inherently problematic, inherently written with conflict. And of course, the spiritual world is the exact opposite, because the spiritual world, we are seeking for happiness within. And when it's happiness within, there is no conflict with other people. The happiness that I have within me, well, it's not something that anyone else can steal. Yeah? It is each one of us develops that happiness inside. And so there is no rivalry of the happiness within that. But not only isn't there any rivalry over the happiness within, but it is even the case that when you have a sense of purity and happiness within, the way that you deal with the external world is better. It leads to harmony because you're no longer interested in that world. You're no longer willing to fight over things in the world. You let it go. You let it be. And for that reason, the inner happiness actually leads to outer harmony. So the sensory world, again, is inherently problematic, where the spiritual world or the inner happiness resolves so many of those problems that we actually have, otherwise have in that world. The Buddha talks about this in other suttas as well. He shows a kind of causal connection between craving and ill will, between craving and violence. This is a thing that you find in a sutta like the Mahanidana Sutta in the Diga Nikaya, the long discourse of the Buddha, where the Buddha shows the connection. Craving always leads to violence, always leads to, uh, not always, but in the long run, it always leads to that. So, uh, in all of these things, I'm reading them out for your reflection try to see if there is some truth to these things and uh, allow these things to sink in, reflect on them, contemplate them, see if they make sense in your own life and allow them to become a power in your own spiritual practice. Let's go on to the next one now. Suppose a person carrying a blazing grass torch 
was to walk against the wind. What do you think, householder, if that person doesn't quickly let go of that blazing grass torch, wouldn't they burn their hands or arm or other limb, resulting in death or death-like suffering for them? Yes, sir. In the same way, sensual objects of the world have been compared to blazing grass torch by the Blessed One that has much suffering and much despair and the distress or something in them is great. Seeing this danger in the sensory objects of the world, you let go of the equanimity based on diversity and you move towards the equanimity based on unity instead. And where all the world's material pleasures cease without remainder or something like that. I'm just kind of making it up because uh, uh, but that is the same sequence for each one of these. Uh, yeah, so sensual objects of the world are like a blazing grass torch. You pick up the blazing grass torch. Well, it is useful for a while. Yeah, if you have a blazing grass torch, you can see where you are going. It helps you to move in the right direction. It helps you to see what is happening in the dark of night. So it has a use. Yeah, blazing grass torch is not all bad, obviously. It is useful. In the same way, sensual pleasures have a degree of happiness about them. Otherwise, we wouldn't be enjoying them. They have their use in a certain way. If we pick up that blazing grass torch in the wrong way, we will suffer. If we go against the wind, we will burn as a consequence. If we pick up the sensual pleasures, if we attach to them in a way that is either too strong or too much, then those sensual pleasures will come to bite us in the backside. Whack! And there will be a problem for us. Yeah. Why is that? Because the moment you attach, the moment you attach at that time, you are saying, Nature, please, and you know that nature is going to take this away from you sooner or later. So the moment you attach, you're asking for suffering. You're saying, Please allow me to suffer. That is the problem. You're picking up the sensual pleasures of the world in the wrong way. So the way we should deal with the sensory objects of the world is by reducing our attachments. We can still enjoy them, but we have to learn to enjoy them in the right way, in a way whereby we don't attach overly, but we try to withhold that, and then we use those things in the world in the wise way. And there is a lot of wisdom. It is very important that the, to remember that the Buddha's teaching does not really say that we should abandon all in the, everything in the sensory world straight away. Far from it. Rather, what we should do is we should ask ourselves what are the most problematic things in that sensory world? Yeah, the really big thing is withdraw from that. Yeah, and then gradually refine our involvement in that world. Yeah, and by refining our involvement in that world, uh, we are then on the right path. Uh, so that is really what it is about. Uh, and then we're heading in the right direction. So it's important to get these things right. Uh, otherwise, we create more suffering uh, than we... Uh, of course, the point is not to create suffering at all. The point is to move towards happiness. Uh, so getting the sequence is important here. Then. Let's go on to the next uh, simile. Um, this is uh, a very strong one. Suppose there was a pit of glowing coals, deeper than a man's height, full of glowing coals that neither flamed nor smoked. Then a person would come along who wants to live and doesn't want to die, who wants to be happy and recoils from pain. And two strong men would grab that person by the arms and drag them towards the pit of glowing coals. What do you think, householder? Wouldn't that person writhe and struggle to and fro? Yes, sir. Why is that? For that person knows if I fall into that pit of glowing holes, that would result in my death or deadly pain. In the same way, the Buddha has compared the sensual objects of the world to a pit of glowing coals. Yeah, and then you go towards the equanimity of unity as a consequence. And this is one of these uh, very fascinating similes uh, because it is so hard to really grasp <coughs> what the Buddha is talking about. What does it mean 
the sensory objects of the world are like the pit of glowing coals. How can it possibly be that you writhe and struggle to get away from the sensual objects of the world? Here is the most wonderful partner you can possibly imagine. The most amazing person with all the right qualities. They are just right. You have this my Mr. Right or Miss Right come into your life and you think, wow, this is it. And then the Buddha says, view it as a pit of glowing coals. How is that possible? How can that possibly be the case? And to understand this, what we have to really do, we have to shift our perspective a little bit and try to see these things from the point of the Buddha. And remember, the Buddha says that we are deluded. We don't see the world as it actually is. In fact, it is as if our perception of the world is distorted. There's a very beautiful uh, verse, I can't remember whether, whether I have included this verse on this retreat or not, uh, where the Buddha says that what ordinary people think is happiness, uh, the Buddha say is suffering, the noble ones say is suffering, uh, and vice versa. What the noble ones say is happiness, the ordinary people think is suffering. Uh, so for that reason, if we have some degree of faith in the Buddha, we should be open to seeing things almost upside down to what we are used to. So how is this possible? And uh, the way that this is possible uh, is to remember that craving is a state that actually is really unpleasant. Uh, craving is a state of agitation. Craving is a state of being separated from what you want to. Craving is a state of lack of feeling incomplete inside of you. Craving is a state of agitation. Craving is like being a slave, where craving is the master driving you on, as I mentioned before. And often we can't see this. We can't see this because craving, it is almost as if we identify with the craving very often. Yeah, we think that craving is moving us towards a happy goal. So if craving is moving us towards a happy goal, then surely craving itself is a positive thing because it encourages us to move in the right direction. But of course, if that goal isn't so great and that if it's just more craving coming afterwards again, then you start to wonder, just craving and craving and craving. What's the deal? Another reason why we enjoy the craving is because it makes us do and we identify with the doer, yeah? We always, in this world, we always put artists and creative people on the pedestal. We think that creation is one of the most wonderful things in the world. Yay, creation, creativity. Wow, look at these people, how creative they are. What a wonderful thing. It drives the cord. Everyone will be more happy. We can enjoy more. More what? Exactly. What more sensual pleasures? Right. But maybe that isn't so useful. Wait a minute. What are we doing this for anyway? It is just feeding the ego because the ego is very much based on the sense of being, the create, being a creative force in our life. Each one of us are agents in our own life trying to create an existence for ourselves. And whenever uh, the, uh, we do something, we feed that illusion of a sense of self, which is the doer in the world. And that is why we are attached to craving, because craving makes us do. It makes us act. It makes us feel good. It makes us feel alive. It uh, indulges the ego inside of us. So that is one reason why we enjoy doing it. That is why craving looks so nice yeah? externally, superficially, if we haven't really looked at it properly and carefully there. So, if, but what if there isn't any self? What if this is all a delusion, which is what the Buddha says? Uh, well, if the Buddha happens to be right, that this is all an illusion, and that self, that door, is just an empty process going on, driven by conditions that pass, it can't be with us. Uh, that the whole purpose of craving collapses. Uh, yeah, it is just this empty force. Yeah, this empty blind force driving us on in darkness, not knowing what we're doing, not heading for anything useful at all. And once you see that, you can start to see craving for what it is. Craving is an irritation. It is a pain. It is an agitation. It is something that is inherently unpleasant. If it has no purpose in driving us to a goal, if there is no goal worthy to be reached, if there is no self that actually is uh, acting out, you have all this doing it. Well, then craving itself is purposeless and it's empty and all that is left is the pain of the craving itself. And this is what we're saying here, yeah? This is the craving of these things. 
And uh, to understand, you know, uh, uh, one way of thinking about the, this, uh, one way of looking at these things uh, is the craving that comes with it. Sexuality, uh, yes, with sexuality comes often a very powerful, very, very strong craving. Uh, and uh, in the human experience, you know, it's, this is kind of one of the things that we consider the highest happiness or pleasure in human experience. Uh, but a very large part of that experience is just a very powerful craving and then the alleviation of the craving uh, at the end. That is really what it is about. Yeah. How great is it really? Oh, yes, there is some pleasure in all of it, uh, but the amount of pain that goes into that, the amount of craving that goes into these things uh, actually is just uh, enormous. Uh, and this is why when, uh, according to the suttas, if you are an arahant, if you are fully enlightened, uh, sexuality is out of the window. There's no more sexuality. Why? Because craving is impossible. You can no longer crave. Why? Because craving is problematic. Another way to think about it, which I always like to use, is the idea of smoking. I don't know if you have ever smoked when I was young and foolish. Occasionally I would have a cigarette. I was trying to be cool when I was young, and just like many young people. It may seem ridiculous now, but that is the case. And um, uh, it was terrible. Yeah, it was really, really awful. Man. It was just this coughing away and this feeling of yuck when you have it, when you, when you smoke a cigarette and you're not really used to it. Uh, but of course, there comes a time, it never happened with me because I didn't smoke much at all, just very occasionally. But there comes a time when you get addicted to the nicotine. And suddenly, what actually is a very unpleasant feeling becomes incredibly pleasurable to someone who is addicted to nicotine. Why is it pleasurable? Well, it is pleasurable not because the smoking itself is ple pleasurable. We know it isn't because we know you start coughing. It is pleasurable simply because it gets rid of the craving. That is the pleasure in it. So it's kind of crazy. Yeah, we, we have this craving, which is unpleasant in itself. We do another act, which is unpleasant, to overcome something else that is unpleasant. And then we, when we overcome what is unpleasant, we call it happiness. It's kind of nuts, yeah? We create suffering for ourselves so we can overcome the suffering afterwards. So this is the problem that is going on here. Right? And so that is a, a rough idea of what the Buddha means by craving being a charcoal pitcher. So, um, I think, I was hoping to get, I always hope to get longer than I get. I never get as long as I, far as I want to get, but I, I think we probably uh, stop there uh, because otherwise we're going to be going too far afield. So uh, anyway, so just, uh, uh, that is just getting into the uh, uh, sensory things. We'll come back to these things in a couple of hours time. Uh, and um, uh, we will then uh, just do a little bit of meditation together now for half an hour or so, and then we can carry on with this, uh, uh, this remarkable sutta afterwards. So, so um, let's get ready for some meditation practice. So. Okay, everyone. So just uh, as always, just uh, uh, relax yourself uh, and uh, make sure that you are at ease, uh, comfortable, not really indulging, but certainly at ease. Uh, don't have any uh, unnecessary aches or problems in the body. It's going to be as always a fairly short meditation, about half an hour or so. So you just need to find a posture you can keep for about half an hour. So. Uh, uh, whatever that posture is, don't worry so much about the posture as long as you are at ease. So sitting on a chair is fine, on the floor, uh, even lying down is okay if that works for you.
So make sure that you uh, give yourself a lot of time at the beginning. Uh, allow yourself to really, really be comfortable and relaxing in that posture that you have. Uh, and one of the uh, biggest problems for meditators uh, is we always try to do the meditation. Uh, and this idea, this trick of learning how to let go and allow it to be, it is one of the most uh, uh, tricky things, it seems, in meditation. So many people get this wrong. You're always doing the meditation rather than allowing the meditation to happen. So bringing up a perception that can help us in just letting go is very useful. One of these perceptions that I works for me is to imagine that you have just been doing a long day's work and, and you are quite tired, you're coming home. And when you come home after a long day's work, you sit down in your favorite armchair. And what do you do? You just relax. You just let go. And what do you do when you relax after coming home? You don't do anything at all. You don't guide your mind. You certainly don't watch your breath. You just sit there and allow things to be there. In the same way with meditation practice, trying to put yourself just in armchair, just relaxing, allowing things to be in the same way you would do when you come home after a long day of work. There's nothing to do. You're not doing the meditation. You're allowing things to calm down all by themselves. And if you can get into this kind of mind space, then you are on the right track.
And uh, then as your mind gradually settles down and as you enjoy just resting here, just sitting back, allowing the world and your thoughts and everything to flow by and gradually allowing things to settle down. Uh, then you can also nudge your mind very gently. Uh, if you find yourself too interested in the world or whatever it might be, uh, remember there's nothing there of any real interest. Uh, what is interesting in the world is found on the spiritual path. Uh, this is where real satisfaction it is to be found. Uh, the world is just an endless sea sequence, an endless sequence of hollow promises with no real goal, with no real purpose. Here is where you find the real purpose. So guide your mind very gently in the right direction.
Okay, so uh, we're coming close to the end uh, of the meditation. Uh, before we come to the very end, uh, I would ask you just to take a moment or two just to uh, recall what has happened over the last half an hour or so. If you do feel more peaceful and at ease, uh, ask yourself why that is the case. Uh, how does the process of meditation actually work? Okay, everyone, that's it for now. So uh, I'll just take my leave and I'll see you back again in a couple of hours. He's gone before we can thank him. <laughs> so as I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to close the meeting now and invite you back at about 10 to 12 or 5 to 12, um, just so that we can get everything prepared, get all the settings fixed. And uh, in this period of time, just to see how much of this momentum of letting go of peace, of mindfulness, you can take into the next activities, whether that's cooking your lunch, how you put that mindfulness into what you're doing, but also the loving kindness as well. So maybe taking your time, not necessarily seeing it as just something to, you know, to get over quickly, so that you can get on to the next thing, but something that's a practice in and of itself and maybe spending a bit longer to see what you can use in your food to nourish yourself, you know, to add that extra bit of care because this is all helping us develop a really wholesome relationship with ourselves. We tend to look after other people much more easily, and much more willingly than we sometimes look after ourselves. So see if you can um, use this opportunity. And if you're fortunate enough maybe to have someone else preparing the meal for you, it's an extra chance to, you know, generate that feeling of gratitude and just learn how to receive. Sometimes this is also um, quite a training, especially for monastics in monastic life. You know, it can be a training to just um, allow yourself to be looked after, allow yourself to receive the gifts, the offerings of others. And to do that gratefully, realizing that, you know, it's also benefiting the giver. It's not only you as the recipient who's benefiting, but it's the, the fact that you're offering another person the opportunity to practice generosity. We have to allow for that as well. So please take the rest that you need as well, if you have a chance, or do some walking meditation. In fact, now can be a good idea if you have time to move straight into some walking, just to maintain that momentum um, as a kind of bridge between maybe the quieter meditation of sitting and the more active meditation of perhaps eating or uh, walking or doing chores, whatever you need to do. So just see how you can take care of yourself in this in-between period. Okay, and we'll see you back soon. Take care. <laughs>